I'm Alex Xu, a teaching professor at the Ansari Institute for Global Engagement with Religion. And joining me today is Garrett Fitzgerald, Andrew W. Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. Um, Garrett holds an MTS degree from HDS, Harvard Divinity School in Religion, Ethics and Politics, and a bachelor's in Peace and Conflict Studies and Religious Studies from Gulliford College. Uh, he served for five years as the head of development for the International Physicians for the Pre uh, Prevention of Nuclear War, a Nobel Peace Prize winning non-governmental organization dedicated to nuclear abolition and armed violence reduction. Uh, hello, Garrett. <laughs> Hi, Alex, good to see you. Um, well, we typically begin these conversations by um, asking the person that, that we're talking to to account for themselves and introduce themselves a little bit. Um, how did you get started on this journey of becoming a, a peace scholar? And uh, later we're going to be talking about your, your work in deco decolonization studies, decoloniality. Um, yeah, where, 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 did, where did it all start and how has it led you to where you are today? Sure. Uh, well, thanks so much for having me and it's great to be joining the folks who are watching at home. Um, so the journey began for me at, at Guilford College. It's a wonderful little uh, liberal arts college, a Quaker school in North Carolina that I attended. Um, and for me, the, the study of peace and the study of religion actually kind of co-emerged. Um, it was, you know, generally... Uh, politically interested and active young person. Um, but I remember getting to college and, you know, it's one of those great kind of liberal arts college success stories, getting there and realizing that, oh, you know, the work of peace and justice is actually something that you can study for. And it's something that you can professionalize in. Um, and so that began kind of a journey for me um, of looking into, you know, questions of peace. And, and for me, this, you know, kind of comes along with part of my own spiritual journey as well. Um, but from the beginning, I was really interested in the way in which um, religion, the idea of religion, um, interacted with peace and conflict. Uh, and so that was very much the focus of my work at uh, Guilford College. Um, that's what led me to Harvard Divinity School. Uh, at that point in time, there were not a lot of uh, kind of master's programs in peace studies that had a really substantive focus on religion. Uh, but there were some fantastic folks at, at Harvard at that point who were doing work um, from a religious studies perspective on issues of peace and conflict. Um, so came out of the Harvard program, um, always knew that I wanted to come back to a program like the, the dual degree here at Notre Dame um, to pursue that kind of you know, advanced training in the, the theory and practice of peace building. Um, and wanted to teach kind of, you know, foster that sort of transformative experience for young people myself. Um, but thought that I should probably have some experience of doing uh, some sort of peace work in the interim to bring to that. I'm going to, you know, try to convince young people that this is a, a good way to spend their, their time. Um, yeah, so I was fortunate enough to serve for five years uh, with IPPNW, the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. Um, as you said, the international NGO that does work uh, historically on nuclear weapons abolition, um, but is involved in, in a lot of different great campaigns over the years, the campaigns to ban landmines and cluster munitions. Um, in addition to the nuclear piece, we're also doing a, a campaign on small arms violence when I was with them. And um, during that time, uh, and we were involved in the negotiation of the ATT with the UN, the arms trade treaty that went into effect a number of years ago, um, and laying the groundwork, the kind of plenary conferences that became um, the treaty that was only ratified, I think, by the 50th country in this past year or so, um, to ban at the, at the level of international law the, the possession of nuclear weapons. And so really wonderful to kind of to see that movement grow. We, um, we were the founding partner of the ICANN movement, International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, which has itself since won a Nobel Peace Prize. Um, so it's just really invaluable experience, especially being able to work with affiliated activists from, uh, we have affiliates in over 60 countries around the world. Um, and so to work with the you know, really dedicated folks all over the world on these issues, um, just invaluable experience to bring with me into the PhD program here in Notre Dame. So just, just to rewind a little bit, how, how did you know that it was, it was a uh, weapons and weapons reduction that um, was going to be your, your jam? Was there a, sort of culminating event, something in the news that you were seeing as a kid, were your, were your parents or was, were you part of a religious group that was particularly attentive to something going on in the world? Mm -hmm. uh, well, so through uh, my college experience and beyond, actually I, I became what we call a convinced friend. So I'm a, a 
we're actually a member of the uh, Society of Friends or Quakers. Uh, and so Quakers have historically been, been very, you know, very concerned with issues of armed violence. It's a, a peace church, a historically pacifist group. Um, but from a professional perspective, that was actually just pure blind luck. Um, I knew I wanted to stay in the Boston area. I'd applied to a couple uh, policy-oriented positions in D.C. Um, a summertime in D.C. I just, <laughs> just didn't really want to move down there. But so, no, so I was trying to, you know, I was trying to be open to whatever form of peace work kind of presented itself as an opportunity. And it turns out that there was an organization with a position of need. Um, and I had some of the skills they were looking for. Uh, and they actually were willing to take a chance on me. They, um, this is one of the benefits I tell you know, our undergrads of a peace education. Um, I did not actually possess all of the skills by any stretch that they were looking for. But uh, they told me after the interview, they said, you know, we think we can teach a person with your background a particular set of, you know, database management skills much easier than we can teach someone with those skills to care about issues of peace and justice. And so, you know, they took that chance on me. And then, you know, five years later, uh, I decided it was time to, to start pursuing the doctoral work. But um, so, you know, I, I was actually looking into any number of different issues around, you know, peace work broadly construed um, in the Boston area. And this is the one that, that just ended up coming up. That's great. Um... So from, from piecework to decoloniality, mm. um, what is decoloniality? Did you discover it here at Notre Dame? Um, how would you introduce it to, to an undergraduate who, who's interested in doing that kind of work? Yeah, so there's, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, and so I'll, I'll start with how I came to the idea because I was not particularly familiar with it. I, I had some work at, at Harvard about you know, in, in looking at post-colonial theory, and we can talk maybe about the distinctions between post-colonial and decolonial theory in a bit. Um, but one of the things that I was interested in, you know, that, that fascinates me about religion and its role in peace and conflict is the role that it plays in constructing, you know, in-group, out-group dynamics, you know, patterns of othering, um, narratives of inclusion and exclusion and supremacy and, and equity, things like that. Um, and so I was really interested in the way, in the way that power already kind of operates you know, one in regard to religion and peace, um, but in terms of how we think about building peace more broadly, in terms about whose views on peace are included and excluded when we define peace and then when we seek about trying to build peace. Um, and so when I was looking at dissertation work, this is already kind of, of gravitated towards what are the particular features of peace building that I think, um, you know, they, they, what have been the mainstays of international peace building over the last 30 or so years? Um, and what are the patterns of power and especially kind of Eurocentrism that might be embedded in that? And so those questions were already kind of germinating for me. And I was interested in looking at questions of how, in particular, um, you know, as a, as a political theorist as well, as somebody who works on democratic theory, how a particular form of Western liberal democracy became synonymous with the promotion of peace in the post-Cold War era. How that became, um, especially, you know, you see uh, Butrus Butruskali, um, UN Secretary General is going to write um, an agenda for peace and then an agenda for democracy to kind of central UN documents in the 1990s that lay a, a blueprint for international peace building in the era sense, um, how this particular form of, of Western liberal democracy became central to the idea of international peace. Um, domestic peace, this is, this is what we need to kind of emerge from either authoritarian or oppressive dict uh, you know, dictatorships, um, civil wars, or peace between countries, the kind of broader democratic peace theory that democracies fight each other less. So intrastate, interstate, democracy somehow has this kind of global reach for how we understand peace. So that was kind of the, the background I was working with. Uh, and one of my advisors, as we're talking about this, said, you know, you should think about looking at, at this decolonial stuff just to kind of, as another wrinkle to trouble the narrative that, you know, peace or this particular form of democracy rather is synonymous with peace. Um, and so I started looking at it and went from, uh, I think what we could call a, a substantive footnote, um, you know, one of the, a footnote that itself is already starting to run a page and a half. Um, and it just grew from that. It snowballed. So now it's an overlong footnote. Now it's a chapter. And now it's actually the, the focus of the entire dissertation. And now it is the basis of a lot of my research and a kind of slow rolling personal existential crisis. Um, so that is... Um, what de uh, decolonial theory and you know, it said the decoloniality is meant to be. And so now we can maybe unpack that concept a little bit. Um, is there any particular way in which you want to kind of foreground this? How, how would you like to, to begin unpacking this, this idea together? Well, uh, let's start with, uh, I, I grasped onto um, the concept of Western liberal democracy as a sort of implicit uh, 
end goal for for peace at the international level. Um, and I suppose a question that our viewers might be interested in is is what what alternative is there? Is it mm-hmm. liberalism? Isn't freedom a good that is universally shared? Isn't democracy a goal that's universally shared? Right, everybody gets a voice, an equal voice with each other. Um, yeah. So deco- decolonization from from which perspective? I guess. <laughs> what are the alternatives? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, that's it. I think it's Wendy Brown has the greatest say, you know, we're all Democrats now, that even your, your kind of most violently repressive regimes will still make sure to have Democratic uh, somewhere in the name. Um, yeah, so I I think maybe before we get to the decolonial piece, it might be useful to kind of unpack what these folks see themselves as responding to. And this is kind of what sets us up to understand what's at stake in the, the drive to or the temptation maybe to universalize uh, a particular political system um, democracy or liberal democracy in this case, um, and what that smuggles in under the surface in terms of um, especially views of, of human personhood, kind of universalizing views of human personhood, um, and views about kind of the nature of our social and shared realities. Um, so what decolonial theorists see themselves as responding to is a world historic form of power that consolidated between about 1450 and 1650, what they call the long 16th century, um, that embedded itself in the development and globalization of specific social, economic, and political structures that today continue to define the kind of quotidian life for a majority of the world's population. co-emerging from these, and religion actually plays a really key part in this that I wanna make sure that we kind of come back and unpack later. Um, But they basically, these folks are taking um, Emmanuel Wallerstein's idea of kind of the world systems theory. So Wallerstein is looking at the emergence of global capitalism during this time. Um, And decolonial theorists are going to say, yes, this is correct. But what Wallerstein misses is the centrality of race to the constitution of a kind of global capitalist modernity that with the emergence of a market-based global economic system, you also see the co-emergence of the hierarchicalization according to race with Europeans put obviously and always at the forefront or the the top of the hierarchy, exactly. Um, Hierarchicalization according to race that fits non-European populations, what we're gonna call racialized and colonized subjects around the world into a hierarchy of labor that tracks onto a historical narrative of civilizational progression, such that Europe is kind of the sole creator, constitutor and benefactor of the idea of modernity itself. And so Europe assumes this place always at the furthest point along a line, a linear path of development that tracks other people's territories in the world behind Europe and inevitably developing along the same trajectory. Um, And that goes technologically, but also in terms of social organization, economic organization, political organization, the idea that um, Europe is the source of the most modern innovations and therefore is what is the model to be emulated. Um, But hiding underneath all that is always that legacy of racial hierarchy and the generations, the centuries of extermination and exploitation of racialized and colonized subjects that it produced and authorized and normalized. And so you could think of um, the extermination uh, through the the process of settler colonization of the Western hemisphere by European peoples. Um, You could think of the Atlantic slave trade um, and kind of the co-constitution of of these, what they call the, the, the foundational genocides of modernity. Um, But going along with that, uh, with the destruction of of bodies of racialized and colonized peoples, decolonial theorists often kind of link this with a a slash. They love two terms of the slash and they'll smush them together. So modernity and coloniality go together. The the kind of light side uh, of history that that Europe tells about itself and then the dark underside. And in this case, we're talking about the genocides and the epistemicides. And so the genocide of indigenous and African peoples coupled with the epistemicide 
uh, epistemicide in this case being the erasure of knowledge, um, which can be accomplished not only through um, the killing of various populations, but also through the enforced erasure of culture, either through dislocation from the land to which culture is tied, uh, or the forced intergenerational suppression of traditional beliefs and practices. Um, and basically, the way this connects back to that original idea about Western liberal democracy is that a part of what modernity does and a part of its enduring violence is the delegitimization or active erasure of alternatives to the story that Europe has been telling about itself for the last several hundred years, such that the common sense alternatives appear not commonsensical at all. There don't, there don't appear to be alternatives, um, such that you know, the 20th century becomes defined by two legacies, liberalism and communism, for example, or in fascism there for a little while, all of which emanated from within this specific European history, but become this global paradigm of uh, you know, conflict. And decolonial theorists are gonna say that there's actually not genuine liberation to be found in either of these traditions because they are ascribing a kind of univocal and still European understanding of history both of which come with a progressivist narrative. You know, it's a, it's a different sort of progression, obviously, but um, both of which ascribe this progressivist narrative onto the totality of the peoples of the world in ways that, again, enacts ongoing violence um, to the pockets of alterity, the pockets of difference, the pockets that have not been completely subsumed by that narration of modernity that we discussed. So that was a lot. So let's, let's, what do you want to unpack from that? So that's modernity. <laughs> that's modernity. Um, well, let's, let's talk about where decoloniality is from. Uh, right now, when we are recording this, there's a lot of hubbub in the US state legislatures about something they're targeting as critical race theory, but actually seems to encompass a, a lot more than that, or is purposely amorphous or vague, mm -hmm. so as to create as much fear as, as possible or something like that. Um, when we talk about decoloniality, can we be specific or is it emerging from everywhere in the global south all at once? Um, is there also you know, people speaking on behalf of decoloniality or that want to join with that project um, from colonial Asia, for instance, right? Indigenous groups and in India or China or Australia or Polynesia, uh, you identified Latin America and, and Sub-Saharan Africa as, as two, two spaces for this, but I can imagine there are a lot of communities that um, would want to criticize the story that Europe has traditionally told itself about itself in the 20th century. Yeah, that's exactly right. So the, the particular strain of, of decolonial theory that I was referencing here, especially kind of tracing its genesis from the kind of economic theory of Manuel Wallerstein, um, this is associated with what we call the modernity coloniality approach or framework or school, um, which does emerge from a, a specifically Latin American context, uh, has spread globally since then in about the last 20 years. Um, but we can see emerging specifically from the work of Peruvian sociologist Anamon Quijano, um, starting in the late 80s and through the 90s. Um, decolonial theory is not reducible to this. There are any number of strains of, of what we might call decolonial theory in the world. Um, and decolonial theorists themselves will acknowledge that um, their movement, you know, the, the movement of this particular school is only a couple decades old, but the decolonial, um, you know, uh, approach that they would view as decolonial basically exists from the moment of contact between, you know, Europe and these different racialized and colonized populations in the global south. Um, but so they say their project we can view as a couple decades old. Um, when we hear decolonial theory in academic contexts, primarily what is being named is in fact this modernity coloniality approach. Um, it has become kind of one of the best known, I would say. Um, there's some fairly well embedded folks within the North American Academy that work in this framework. It has been, as you mentioned, uh, it's been globalized somewhat. Um, it's taken up, uh, there are a number of scholars working in South Africa, um, Sabelo Ndobogashini and Morgan Lobu uh, in particular, who are working in this framework um, from a South African context, doing some really fascinating work there. Um, there are, I know that there are actually folks working in uh, a Southeastern European framework to look at this, um, kind of looking at the way that this plays out in the Balkans. There are folks uh, using this framework um, to look at 
the Ottoman and Russian empires and the Japanese empire, you look, look back to the 20th century and the way that it helps us in frame the colonial projects of non-European nations. Um, so it definitely has traveled globally. Um, but this, so that is kind of the primary framework if you hear an academic say decolonial theory, that's mostly what they mean, um, which we can then kind of separate that out from um, a variety of uh, indigenous political theories, um, both kind of global look, looks at indigeneity and then uh, indigenous uh, work specific to North America, to the you know, United States and Canada, um, which is explicitly concerned with decolonization um, and the, the repatriation of land, um, but tends to view that more uh, as a grounded, uh, in every sense of the word, their project rooted to these particular land masses as opposed to um, this kind of global systems theory approach. Um, and then other kind of antecedent forms of anti-colonial thought, um, which you can view as kind of the Caribbean and Sub-Saharan African, um, some, some uh, kind of South and Southeast Asian as well, um, looking at more pol explicitly politically affiliated movements that predate but are claimed by decolonial theorists. Um, and so that would be the work of you know, folks like uh, Amy Césaire and Frantz Fanon, for example, um, and a number of sub-Saharan African political leaders as well. Uh, we're reading, reading up pamphlets and tracts on, on kind of anti-colonial political thought. Uh, so those are, that's the kind of constellation of different ways you can kind of carve this up. So you know, this particular approach to decolonial theory uh, is in relation with, but is also does not subsume you know, a variety of indigenous and uh, earlier anti-colonial approaches. We've got anti-colonial, mm -hmm. um, so Africana, Caribbean, mm -hmm. um, decoloniality mm -hmm. from the global south. So starting maybe around Peru and, um, and then decolonization, which is North America. And then how well does post-colonial theory play with those? Post-coloniality I associate with a Palestinian thinker, Palestinian American thinker, Edward Said, um, and a whole bunch of South Asian historians and, and critical theorists as well. Uh, do they do they play well together, or, or again is this broad constellation? <laughs> They're all talking to each other all the time. Yeah. So the, they're emerging. So this particular strand of, of decolonial theory and and the kind of constellation of postcolonial thinkers you just named are dealing with broadly with the same phenomenon. The question being that despite the fact that colonization is a global political construct, is a direct form of rule uh, by European powers over peoples and, and nations in the global south, despite the fact that that has largely eroded by mid-century, a lot of the structures of domination, the kind of informal social and economic and political structures of domination have remained. And we're trying to unearth what has enabled that. Um, the difference, I think there's a number of differences we could look at. Um, one is just kind of disciplinary in terms of who or, or what disciplines these scholars are drawing from. And so um, you have scholars like, uh, you named Said, um, Guy to Spivak, um, scholars in that post-colonial milieu will tend to draw more from literary studies and history as opposed to a more social sciences focus. So um, I mentioned sociology, political science, anthropology that you see defining a lot of the, the Central and South American folks. Um, the bigger distinction though, I think is time frame. Um, and the, the critiques of this, I'm giving you the decolonial critique of the post-colonial scholars um, is that they are trying to critique a global system of power that they find kind of in media rents, that they begin too late because they're mobilizing specific positionalities informed by the global South experiences. Um, they're mobilizing those positionalities, but still primarily using critical European tools um, and that they're not getting at the root causes. And so you could think of um, you know, Said, the, the settler experience or the, the colonial experience in Palestine begins in the 20th century uh, in, in some concrete ways. And, you know, the, the British mandatory, I mean, uh, the experience of British mandatory Palestine, right? Um, you could look at uh, the, you know, the constellation of scholars that we've already mentioned uh, emerging from the Indian subcontinent. So Gayatri Spivak, Homi Baba, uh, other folks there. Uh, we can talk about the different models of colonialism that informed this, the difference between the settler colonization that defined 
the experiences in Central and South America and later North America um, versus the more franchise and extractivist colonial model that we see in India. Um, but you're not going to see consolidation of British control over the Indian subcontinent until after roughly, I think, the Battle of Plassey is maybe 1757. Um, and so the decolonial critique is that you're going to see scholars from these contexts beginning their uh, attempts to, to excavate these colonial legacies centuries after the primary um, developments of a European colonial modernity have already been set. So you can go back to those experiences, you know, um, you know, the decolonial folks, again, that the long 16th century is 1450 to 1650. And so by the time you get to the mid 18th century into the consolidation of British control over India, for example, you're talking about global economic and also subjective dynamics. The European sense of self and racial superiority has already been conditioned by hundreds of years of domination of racialized and colonized peoples in the global South. And so the decolonial critique is that this kind of post-colonial scholarship is not getting deep enough into the history because they're not going back far enough. And so they can't get at the full depth of the dynamics, again, not only the kind of broader structural dynamics, but the subjective dynamics in terms of how these concrete historical experiences of domination and exploitation and extermination has conditioned Europe by this point, such that, again, you know, you kind of, if you pick the story up in 1757 or through the 19th or even into the early 20th century, you're missing a lot of that kind of the substrate upon which a European modernity is constructed. Um, so that's the kind of the, the deeper historical critique. And then the critique, the methodological critique um, basically comes down to the fact that these, the, the decolonial folks are going to say the post-colonial scholars are by and large going to be relying on Foucault and Derrida and Lacan and other critical Western resources to try to unpack a colonial condition and thereby are using these tools to basically trace the inside of European modernity, as opposed to making the decolonial shift, the pivot, uh, the moving what they call the, the locus of enunciation to a point outside of that modernity. So despite the fact that they're mobilizing global South positionalities, the decolonial critique of post-colonial scholarship by and large will be that it is an imminent critique of a European modernity because it is still relying on a specific set of, I mean, it basically comes down to the, you know, kind of Audre Lorde question of the master's tools. And that critique from the fairly pointed critique, and there has been a lot, I mean, you can go back and look at, at the fractures in this and, you know, specific conferences and reading groups, you can see the early and fairly acrimonious divisions between kind of post-colonial and emergent decolonial scholarship. Um, but it boils down to this question of the sufficiency of what decolonial scholars are going to view as the master's tools. So let's talk about the tools, tools outside <laughs> of this, uh, of the walls of, of the prison that modernity <laughs> has erected for us. Um, so you work with uh, the Contending Modernities group last year to uh, curate a, a series of blog posts about, about religion and, and decoloniality. Um, so let's, let's add religion to this mix. Does, does religion get us outside of European modernity? Do other non-European religions get us outside of European modernity? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, who, who all did you get to participate and what did you learn and uh, what might our less, um, both our academically informed and our um, people who have been out of school for a while, um, what, what might we be able to gather from, from this project of yours? <laughs> sure, uh, so the, the quick answer to your question is, is yes, that the non-European religions can maybe help us think beyond this kind of Eurocentric modernity with a large caveat, which comes around the way in which we understand the category of religion to work. And this is in large part what that series with contending modernities was, was meant to help us bring into focus is the way in which religion itself is a category and especially as an analytic within the Western Academy has functioned to reinscribe a lot of these same dynamics I was just discussing um, in kind of more economic or political spheres. Um, and to understand that and some of what the, the work we're doing, so I think this is uh, on Yunte's essay for the, uh, for the series, um, some of the work that has been done in this space, um, there's a, a great 
edited volume on this that I believe is just coming out. I think it's on Unta and Eleanor Craig and Santiago Splatsky, who are all names to know if you're interested in kind of decoloniality in the study of religion. Um, but one of the dynamics that we were trying to, to expose through the series is the role that religion played and the invention of a specific understanding of religion played in the construction of that colonial modernity uh, that I just described and in maintaining some of the dynamics that I just you know, described as well. Um, and the story that decolonial theorists will tell about that is, um, you know, 1492, we're going to get kind of the, you know, Columbus's encounter, um, you know, in the Caribbean world. And so the launch of the kind of Colombian exchange there, um, but immediately preceding that, and in many ways providing the political opening and monetary support for Columbus's expedition, is the fall of the last Muslim emirate on the Iberian Peninsula, the Emirate of Granada, um, which I believe is surrendered in January of 1492. Um, and so alongside Columbus's expedition, you have the consolidation of um, of kind of what, what the emergent sense of you know Spanish nationhood, but also Europeanness um, in the conquest, the reconquest, uh, to use the you know the, the notion of the Reconquista of the Iberian Peninsula, um, and the accompanying either forced massacre outright sometimes, but the forced expulsion or conversion of the Iberian Peninsula's Muslim and Jewish populations. As a part of this process though, um, you see emerging, according to decolonial theorists, for the first time, a sense of biological race and that kind of like scientific biological language isn't there yet. Um, but the idea that there is something in blood in particular, and uh, Gil Anijar has written uh, about this as well, um, but the idea that there's something in blood that can taint converso populations, so the converted Muslims and Jews, such that despite their professed conversions, they can never actually be real Catholics or real Europeans. Um, and so decolonial folks will look at this dynamic as the emergence of a modern understanding of what we would now call biological racialization, such that you can't convert out of. You know, if belief was the defining factor, that would be one thing, but um, we actually see the kind of linkage at the very earliest stages of modernity between religion and this kind of racial alterity. And so what Anyunta describes in the series is how you go from having Muslims and Jews coded right, early 1492 as being of the wrong religion to encounters across you know, both in Sub-Saharan Africa and then uh, in the Caribbean uh, and Atlantic coasts of what's now Central and South America, of people who possess no religion. But so indigenous peoples of these lands who are being racially coded, but also do not possess what is visible to their invaders as a form of religion. The monotheisms, what we think of as the Abrahamic faiths, are recognizable as a religion to uh, you know, the victors of the Reconquista in Spain. That's a religion is the wrong one. But these indigenous peoples, these enslaved Africans don't have a visible religion. And that original dynamic, the kind of racialization and mapping of that racialization onto different forms of, or the presence and absence of religion is written down through the centuries until we get to the present time. And it continues to inform um, those in-group and out-group dynamics. And the way it can, uh, per this essay series, it informs the way in which academic scholarship around religion is itself a way of perpetuating these dynamics, such that you can think of what is classed under even the idea of world religions that is taught in maybe kind of global civilization classes. And you can see efforts to construct or fit um, the religious practices of different peoples into a box defined there at the outset of modernity, whereas other you know, indigenous beliefs and belief systems that don't fit neatly into those boxes are kind of shunted out of the category of religious studies altogether. So now that's the realm of anthropology. That's something different. That's not religion. That's not the way we study religion. Um, and so that's a very long way of saying that despite this, there are folks working, and I, I point you here, especially to the work of um, 
Salman Zaid and the cluster of folks that he has around him working in the area of critical Muslim studies uh, are kind of viewing the study of and study in Islam, for example, as an explicitly decolonial project. Um, and so there's really fascinating work being done, um, again, from that broader sociological perspective, how we understand you know, the category of religion and religions to work, uh, but also grounded firmly within diverse religious traditions, um, both of which, especially when taken together, are kind of trying to erode that inherent Eurocentrism and Euro supremacy, Euro supremacy um, that the category of religion itself has been responsible for helping to perpetrate over the centuries. So um, religion has a lot to say about this, um, but it's very hard to have those conversations in academic spaces that are so thoroughly conditioned by a very particular understanding of religion. Very good. You mentioned uh, the word epistemicide a couple of turns back in our conversation. I'm wondering if either you or the decolonial theorists that you've been in conversation with um, have, a, have a solution for epistemicide um, and whether that solution involves refraining from killing other forms of thinking and making knowledge or resurrecting older forms that have been killed off in the past. How, how is that thought of, <laughs> ontologically, to use a big fancy academic word, how is that thought of as a, as a living project? Yeah, absolutely. So, so what you're describing is uh, kind of what we can think of as the epistemic register of, of the work of decoloniality. The decoloniality is achieved in a material sense, in part by trying to preserve and access forms of knowing, ways of knowing and being in the world that have not been completely subsumed or erased by Eurocentric modernity. Um, decolonial folks are, are, are not, they, they try to be very clear about the fact that they're not trying to romanticize any possibility of return to a kind of pre-contact place. Like there's no pure exterior left to the modern colonial system. Again, they view it as impinging on the quotidian life of literally the entire global population. Um, but what they're looking at is what Enrique Dussel is going to call pockets of relative exteriority. So ways of thinking otherwise that have not been entirely subsumed. Um, and in the broadest sense, the project of decoloniality holds that the solution to a more, and this is where it comes back to my work, but a more genuinely peaceful form of coexistence lies somewhere, not in any one place, but that there are answers within these pockets of relative exteriority. And we look at, um, you know, the warfare and the strife and the unprecedented environmental degradation that has been kind of brought about by this Eurocentric modernity and the kind of progressivist narrative that it's given us. Um, and it can be very tempting to say that, yes, maybe we should be looking for answers elsewhere. Um, and so that's kind of the project of decoloniality. Um, and it is very broad as the ethical thrust of this actually kind of ties into my work with this idea of pluriversality, um, which we can unpack in a second. But um, Pluriversality as an ethical goal is basically concerned with the maintenance of that diversity of epistemic and ontological, kind of constituted ontological realities in the world. Basically, that there are ways of knowing and being in the world that are irreducible to kind of a Western modernity, um, and that possible futures outside of that modernity necessarily will emerge from those pockets and not from within that space itself, right? This isn't a dialectic you can kind of work yourself out of from within that Western modernity. You need to look to that relative exteriority. And so um, the ethical project of decoloniality begins at its thinnest level with the need to preserve what has remained. Uh, and there is a project of trying to uncover um, what has been lost as well. Um, but I think there's a deeply pragmatic vein in there too. That you can't, again, you can't turn back the clock. Um, you can pick these traditions up and you can reconstitute part of them. You can take up and engage with them creatively. Um, but much as it tries to look to what has survived, it is also an inherently forward-looking project in a way that I think its detractors would view it as trying to roll back time to, you know, to 1491, um, when it is much more, again, kind of pragmatically concerned with how do we work ourselves out of the particular, again, world historic system of violence, which we find ourselves embedded right now. 
brilliant answer sets us up for the for the next question, which is uh, we wanted to ask you about the title of your dissertation, which I'll read to everybody and hopefully not embarrass you too much. Pluriversal <laughs> peace building, colon, decolonial dialogue, democracy, and the epistemic politics of peace. You've already addressed a lot of this in your in your previous answer, uh, but I think we at Ansari are, are especially interested in this, in this notion of dialogue, right? Is it dialogue? Is it that continual keeping alive by trying to express to others and oneself through the practice of dialogue? Is that is that how we keep the pluriverse going? If that is, if I'm even understanding the term correctly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, so let's let's unpack the idea of the pluriverse first, since I mean, so we've, we've named it already. So, um, as I mentioned already, so so pluriversality has this ethical valence, which we'll come back to in a second. But um, at its at its core, pluriversality is an ontological claim, a claim kind of a kind of the nature of being um, that is responding to the sense that it associates again with the Eurocentric modernity that the world is unitary, that the world is singular. And as such can be known and controlled via any single form of thought. And it identifies this particularly with kind of the, the sense of Cartesian scientific view of the world where you have an I, the kind of ego cogito that can stand outside of time and space and have a, a true grasp on the nature of reality abstracted from your embodied self and your embeddedness in social, political, other contexts, cultural contexts. Um, and so it views that understanding of the world, again, as unitary and as noble and governable through any one mode of thought as an extension or expression, indeed one of the highest forms of expression of that kind of Eurocentric modernity. The, the, Europe is unique because Europe has found out how to know. And Europe can do, Europe can, can undertake this massive remaking of the globe because it knows. It has the one authorized way of knowing. And so pluriversality claims that in fact, the world is not one. There are multiple constituted ontologies. There are multiple worlds inhabited um, that are known in different ways. And so this is the kind of the interplay between epistemic politics and the constituted ontologies of non-Western peoples. Um, and the, the decolonial claim is the priority of these epistemologies, so the ways of knowing and the worlds to which they give you access. And so that's kind of the, the ontological epistemic thrust of pluriversality is that other worlds, to borrow the phrase from um, Arturo Escobar, uh, that other worlds are actual, other worlds exist. And part of what is lost through epistemicide and genocide, through the erasure of racialized and colonized peoples is in fact those worlds, the ability to access those worlds through the systems of knowledge and meaning making that constitute them. And so when that knowledge is gone, the worlds are gone as well. Um, and so pluriversality as an ethical project then becomes concerned with trying to vouchsafe those worlds. And so the promotion of a world in, to use the kind of Zapatista phrase that decolonial theorists love, um, the goal is to create a world in which many worlds fit, in which other ways of knowing and being in the world do not fear erasure. And so that is the kind of cultivation of the pluriverse as a political project. So as an ontological claim, they just take it as a given that other worlds are actual, they exist, and that they are in grave danger of being subsumed and erased by this kind of monolithic, or if not monolithic, monovocal um, European modernity. And so the goal is to try to save these things and then figure out the kind of second order question that becomes what sort of social and political structures and orders do we need to put into place to maintain that equilibrium among these different ways of knowing and being. So the first order question is kind of the, the preservation of other ways of knowing and being, and then figuring out how they live as a second order question, how they engage with one another. Um, and so that's where some of my work touches down this idea of pl uh, pluriversal dialogue which emerges as a practice that decolonial theorists hold up um, as a practice that is already in operation among different racialized and colonized groups in the global South when they interact with one another. Uh, and basically the idea of pluriversal dialogue is that there are ways of interacting across these epistemic and ontological divides that don't presume 
that they need to be reconciled or that their differences need to be settled, um, that there is room for both. And even despite these, these incommensurable differences, that there is room for positive collaboration uh, around specific projects. And this is kind of where you can see the, the broader shared work of decoloniality coalescing. Um, and one of the ways in which decolonial theorists describe pluriversal dialogue as emerging is through the use of what they call connectors. And this is in the work of, of Walter Mignolo, especially that you see this. Um, the idea that there are certain connectors, concepts that travel and in some cases have been globalized um, through this kind of violent, you know, again, kind of expansion of a Eurocentric modernity, um, but have been globalized and then emptied of their meaning and creatively reappropriated by different racialized and colonized communities such that they are no longer again reducible to their meaning within European or kind of Euro descendant contexts. Uh, and so one of the concepts that Mignola holds up in particular is this idea of democracy. Um, and this is, he talks about it uh, in a couple of his works, and this is what I focus on in the dissertation at some length, is looking at communities like the Zapatista movement in Southern Mexico, um, or looking at Aymara and Quechua communities kind of spanning the Andes, and the ways in which these communities have taken the idea of democracy, the kind of democracy as a signifier, which in the West, you can draw a straight line through, um, you know, from kind of contemporary liberal democracy back to the revolutionary era and it's going to take us through you know christendom and back through ancient rome into athens which the the, con the construction of that narrative is itself a part of the self, the self narration of modernity like that line is it's not as neat and easy as they would like you to believe but that that linear consolidation of history is a part of how modernity narrates itself but so anyway these communities are taking the idea of democracy democracy is a signifier emptying it of that lineage but saying we actually have um practices, inherited practices. Uh, and so in the Zapatista context, they look at the kind of um, this sort of syncretic mind understanding of the, the, the value of mandar obedeciendo, it's like to lead to, is to obey or lead by obeying. Um, and they view their political system as actually expressing a form of democracy that has nothing to do historically with that linear self-narration. You see the same thing in the Andes in which, um, you know, kind of uh, members of these communities um, we'll look at the IU, which is the kind of basic social unit of these Andean communities as a form of democracy that, again, owes nothing to that, that Western lineage of democracy. And in fact, uh, by taking the family as kind of the basic unit of analysis actually troubles the idea that there is a liberal subject. Um, it does not necessarily involve voting in the way that we think, uh, you know, these, so it doesn't have any of the other signifier or doesn't, it doesn't signify the same things that Western democracy signifies, but they're still using the same signifier. And so basically, decolonial theorists are going to look at these connectors as spaces of discursive encounter across different forms of epistemic and ontological difference that can enable um, contingent forms of understanding and collaboration in the pursuit and the resistance of modern to modernity and the pursuit of decolonial projects. And so when you find a concept like this that is shared by different communities, it gives you access or enough of a foothold in these other worlds and across these divides um, you can start having those conversations. And the goal isn't to reconcile those differences. And this is what separates it from, I think, a lot of kind of the more traditional forms of interreligious dialogue that you would see, especially in peace building work. The goal is not to sit down and hash out here are exactly what our differences are around the role of, you know, theological category X or the function of a particular, you know, individual across different forms of scripture. Um, the goal is to gain, a, again, this kind of pragmatic access to these other worlds such that you could pursue specific decolonial projects in ways that vouchsafe, again, those, the, those forms of difference and keep them alive. Um, so decolonial theorists are already looking at the way that can be done with this concept of democracy. And what my work takes is basically digging deeper into that and saying, we can see how this is already happening in concrete instances around the world in which these communities are coming together and using concepts like democracy to create spaces in which they can resist the pressures of a European modernity. Um, can the same thing be done with the idea of peace? How does the concept of peace interact with the pluriverse? Uh, and the short answer is yes, that there are ways in which we can see this happening. Ideas of uh, kind of the globalization of indigenous peace building networks. Peace again, meaning something absolutely irreducible across these contexts, but creating a space in which these encounters and collaborations can happen. Um, and so the idea that pluriversal peace building in its broadest sense is a promotion of peace that maintains that pluriverse in both its ontological and its ethical sense. Um, 
and as a result, and most challenging to scholars of kind of the, you know, the, the field of peace studies, is therefore incompatible with a lot of the systems and structures that the field of peace building and peace studies as a historical discipline has centered. The nation state, uh, the global capitalist world system, um, you know, uh, systems and structures that have been identified by decolonial theorists as inherently averse to the maintenance, or as hostile to the maintenance of the pluriverse. Um, but which have defined international peace building for at least the last 30 years. And so that's the tension. What does it look like to build peace in a way that is also sensitive to and protective of that pluriverse? That's really exciting. I did not realize that there, there's this global movement, South-South dialogue, South-South networks. I think there's a lot that I, I personally could learn learn from, from watching, watching them. Um, so two questions. The former is, so um, one topic that you mentioned these two groups that these groups discuss is, is the idea of democracy and another is potentially the idea of peace. What happens when they get together and talk about religion or theology? What sort of linkages do they, do they find on the one hand? So that's, I guess, a more abstract philosophical theological question. Mm -hmm. um, and the second is, you know, a lot of our, our students, a lot of graduates, um, a lot of ourselves as, as scholars or practitioners, um, we will be representing something like a nation state or a global corporation <laughs> or an international body. Um, how do we get in or how do we get in the dialogue? How do we get in the network? Or do we just lay off and say, that's your space? Mm -hmm. Come to us when you're ready. Um, we don't have to be, we don't have to have a seat at that table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, great conversations. I'm gonna take the second one first. Um, yeah, so having, having shared some spaces with some you know, decolonial theorists and practitioners, uh, I think there is space there, but from my experiences and especially you know, occupying a positionality as a, a you know, white Western male, like all the, the forms of privilege that, that my own positionality affords me, um, the space, there is a welcome to that space, but it's also been very explicit, at least in the encounters that I've had, that that space is not a space of um, process, I guess, for you know, what we might think of as, as, as allies, however we want to frame that. Um, the, the invitation is to have done the deconstructive work necessary. And in, in a broad sense, kind of my research and my dissertation project is about me trying to make sense of this for myself, to be able to, to approach spaces like that from a more kind of authentically decolonial perspective, um, that it's it's don't you know come here looking to you, you say the invitation is you come and participate. Don't come here looking for answers. Don't come here looking for therapy. Uh, do your own work and then come help us do our work uh, is is one way that I, I've heard it expressed. And so um, I think there is a need, and you see this across again several of the different strains of you know decolonial, anti-colonial, and, and indigenous theorists in the U.S. and Canada will write about this too. They say like there's room for collaboration there. Um, but again, it's not the, the responsibility of racialized and colonized peoples to help the benefactors of a Eurocentric modernity to do that unpacking for themselves, I think is the way that that most frequently gets answered uh, in the literature and in, in those spaces that I've been privileged to occupy. Um, but so there's not, so one of the things I do want to flag too, um, pivoting out of the modernity coloniality folks more towards that kind of uh, North American uh, indigenous kind of decolonization movement, but uh, there are ways of thinking about this too. Um, I have a colleague here at the, the Crack Institute, Justin De Leon, um, put me onto the, the metaphor that I, I really like using for this. And so it comes from the work of, uh, of Wayne Yang, uh, writing under a pseudonym, but he, he writes about what that looks like to be embedded in these systems and whether that is, uh, you can think of that system as the nation state system as uh, an institution of a higher education like Notre Dame, the broader academy. Um, but he uses this metaphor of, of R2-D2, right? Like the robot from Star Wars. It's like, you're R2-D2 in the Death Star. Um, you can't blow up the whole thing by yourself, you know, but there are unique ways that your positionality allows you to interface with it. And so you can open some doors, you can close some others, you can start or put out fire. You know, there's, there are ways to interact with the system, even while trying to seek the system's eradication, which comes back, um, you know, in a very real way to that question we had earlier of, of master's tools. And so that's not, that is not the creation of a system beyond because the, the responsibility or the opportunity for that 
is being shifted. The locus of that enunciation must be shifted outside of the system itself. Um, but it is finding ways to make the system, you know, to mitigate harm um, that the system is, is imposing while it exists, and also to find, start finding structural weaknesses within the system itself. Um, and so there is work to be done within all of these spaces, again, from the micro up to the kind of, kind of macro political spaces um, to, to work on these systems. But again, the goal is to look beyond these systems um, for alternatives. Uh, and so that's that's kind of the, the broader goal I give you, uh, or broader answer I give you to the second question. Um, the first question, this is something that I actually need to know more about. I mean, the, the study of religion is really only a couple years into grappling with issues of decoloniality in a serious and sustained way. And I, I, we've mentioned some of the, the folks who are working on this so far. There, there have been other um, subsequent series with contending modernities. And I would recommend that everyone go and check those out, um, kind of looking at philosophy of religion, um, study of religion, uh, and then uh, the other networks of scholars, especially the Critical Muslim Studies Network um, has been doing really fantastic uh, work there. Um, there's a, a series of, um, basically seminars uh, conducted by uh, Dialogo Global, um, mostly in Spain, some in Central and South America as well, I believe, uh, looking at different facets of this question. And so I was able to, uh, a couple of years ago, to go to one in Santiago de Compostela in Spain, um, looking at liberation theology and decolonial thought. There's also one specifically focused on critical Muslim studies. Um, so there are different kind of thematic workshops that folks can look into if you're interested in pursuing these further. We have kind of a, a global collection of scholars and graduate students who are coming together for a week um, to talk through these issues. Um, so I'd recommend um, looking at some of that, or you can see just the names of the people who are involved in that to get kind of a who's who of, of who's working in these spaces right now. Super exciting. Thank you for sharing that with, with me personally and for the rest of our viewing audience as well. Uh, we're coming to the end of our time, so I thought we could wind this up by me asking a more pragmatic question for people in the audience and for, for you yourself. Um, I, I feel like there's a lot of discussion about decoloniality where I work in, in Buddhist studies, but also just in the academy more, more broadly. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about whether what, you know, various people inhibiting the positionalities that we have, right, um, are doing enough or, or not enough, or if it's performative or, or whatever. Um, where, does, where does the practice of decoloniality start for you and where do you envision it ending? And uh, with that, we can, we can wrap up. Sure. So some big, big forward looking questions for the end. Um, so I, I, would, I would echo some of the concerns there about the performativity of this and the overuse of the idea of, of decolonization and decoloniality. Um, that's actually, so um, Wen Yang, who I just mentioned, um, co-authored with Eve Tuck, the, the famous article, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, which again, kind of links back to that um, indigenous tradition of, of um, in North America here. Um, but basically a concern about overuse of decolonization um, such that it plays out only or exclusively on that epistemic register. And so, decolonizing our syllabi, decolonizing our workplaces, while still occupying, in, in the case of Notre Dame, you know, land historically inhabited by the Bukega Band of Potawatomi, um, others in, indigenous peoples. Um, and in the words of, of, of Tuck and Yang, um, decolonizing your mind without having to actually give up any other forms of power, right? And so I, I remember, um, you know, the, the summer before the pandemic, I was invited to an event um, you know, here in the South Bend area that was trying to decolonize a local park, which meant take down a statue of Christopher Columbus, which I think is a laudable goal. But you can see the slippage of the word there, like removing Columbus from that statue has not actually returned this land to any of the indigenous peoples from which it's been seized. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's tempting to use that language um, to, to, to describe things that, again, don't unsettle these existing systems and structures. But I try to be pretty guarded in what I do and in terms of how I apply that um, to my own actions. Uh, for me, one of the ideas, I mean, I, I shared the R2D2 metaphor with you, which is one that I'm very taken by, um, but there's another concept of, um, that I've taken from a, a decolonial theorist named Nelson Maldonado Torres. Uh, and this is part of what I view my work as an educator is, is doing. Um, Maldonado Torres talks about the idea of epistemic coyotismo um, which kind of, it doesn't translate easily, but he's basically talking about um, coyotes, the coyotes, the, 
uh, smugglers who are, are paid to bring people across the southern border of the United States. Uh, and so these are the leading folks across the deserts, bringing them over international borders. And so it places this idea of bringing unwanted bodies, racialized bodies into physical spaces in which they are not welcome. And so epistemic coyotismo for Maldonado Torres is the idea that people in positions of power, or we could think of as, as thought leaders, but, but educators, folks in higher education, um, can play a similar role in smuggling in unwanted and unwelcome knowledge into spaces in which it has historically been excluded. Um, and again, part of the, the critique of, you know, from the modernity to coloniality paradigm is that we're having a, historically, we've been unable to um, find alternatives to existing social and economic and political structures because the other forms of knowledge from whence they come have been so effectively erased both in the world at large through kind of the genocide and epistemicide, but also through their delegitimization within academic halls of power, right? The, they provide data to scholars, but they don't provide alternative theories, right? They are the things that we study or the objects of study rather than modes of thought and analysis in and of themselves. And so in a very real sense, so I, I taught a class on decoloniality and peace building. And so part of what we're trying to do there is to trouble the ways in which um, different disciplines, and you could, this could be peace studies as a discipline, this could be religious studies as a discipline, take your pick, um, but the ways in which these disciplinary lenses enforce what is again, uh, traceable back to that original racial hierarchicalization of peoples and of the knowledges that they produce and the kind of um, the, the reduction of non-European forms of knowledge again to below the threshold where they're, re they're recognized as knowledge at all. These are superstitions, these are beliefs, these are not. Knowledge on par with the types of knowledge that we pursue in spaces of higher learning like this. Um, so as an educator, that's where I see a lot of my work taking place right now is just trying to um, get these frameworks out there, making sure that especially students at a, at a university like Notre Dame that deals by and large with a fairly privileged student body um, and has a good track record, especially in the peace-based program of placing students in positions to make you know, real forms of change, that they're leaving here equipped with those kind of critical lenses, that they're leaving here having encountered other forms of knowing and thinking about concepts first and foremost about peace. Um, and so that's kind of where I see my own work doing this, but it, it is, I mean, the longer term struggle is there. And I, I have grappled, um, you know, one of the logical places you could go with this is that if you're concerned about the kind of the authorization of specific expert forms of knowledge around peace building and the kind of, you know, the, the patterns that, that inscribe and reinscribe those forms of authority, that one of the best things to do would be to stop minting PhDs in peace studies. <laughs> and you can imagine as somebody who's trying to write a dissertation to get a PhD in peace studies, and that's kind of a hard thing to grapple with. But again, I, I think it comes back to that idea of, you know, of being within the system and finding ways to tinker and tamper um, within, um, because it, it could be, you know, we're talking about centuries of history. We're talking about a problem that is global in its scope. Um, and I think there's probably a little bit more to be gained by, by trying to spread these ideas and making sure that students are leaving a place like Notre Dame, having had these conversations as opposed to just removing yourself from the equation. Um, so that's quite possibly a rationalization, but that's how I have found a way to make peace with it, at least lately. Uh, we'll see what the future holds. Michelle, this has been an entrancing and, and really informative for me personally uh, conversation. Hope you can continue the work of, of making coyotes and, and bringing coyotes um, all over all, all kinds of borders and uh, look forward to, to the work that, that you keep on, on producing.